My interest in emotional awareness derives from the goal of helping people optimize their physical and emotional health. And I think that the same principles that inform helping people get better clinically uh, can be extended to the goal of flourishing and, and getting the most out of life. Um, practically all the talks have mentioned the distinction between implicit and explicit processes, and I'm going to extend that to emotion. And um, in preparing this talk, I decided to err on the side of keeping it at the conceptual level, and so I'm going to really de-emphasize data, you know, supporting the points that I'm going to make. But, for example, with levels of emotional awareness, we have over 120 papers published on this, and I'm going to refer to very few of those. So I thought I'd start off with some of the foundational concepts that were the basis for this conference. So, flourishing and the problem of implicit motives. For flourishing to occur, mental states and actions must be integrated in pursuit of the goal of living well. With regard to implicit motives, in contrast to explicit, they're not consciously accessible. They're unavailable for reflection. They do influence what we do, in contrast to explicit motives, which are under conscious control. Implicit motives uh, involve actions that are not connected to conscious mental states, because they're implicit. They're difficult to change, <clears throat> and they develop early in life. So that sets up a dilemma and a challenge. One possibility is that implicit motives develop in childhood, are not available for reflection, and therefore can't be explicitly endorsed or rejected. In other words, you can't know what your implicit motives are. Or maybe you can find out what your implicit motives are and bring your explicit motives in line with them, um, but you can, you can know them, but you can't change them, and you have to adapt to them, which kind of creates restrictions. So the conclusion from that is that implicit motives, because they affect behavior but can't be changed, interfere with the integration of mental states and actions and thus prevent flourishing. And I'm going to argue for the following conclusions. Uh, number one, implicit motives can be known. Uh, emotional awareness is a key to that. And it involves facilitating the transition from implicit to explicit emotion. And implicit motives can be changed. Uh, and it involves reconsolidation of emotional memories. Um, and emotional awareness plays a key role, but it's more complex in terms of involving emotion memory interactions. Um, <clears throat> conscious emotion processing can therefore promote integration of mental states and actions to not only reduce suffering, but also promote flourishing. So um, I'm going to give this talk in five parts. First, we're going to talk about what emotion is and try to explain how I relate emotion to implicit motives. Uh, then we'll talk about levels of emotional awareness, which involves making the transition from implicit to explicit and different degrees of emotional awareness. Uh, we'll then talk about how implicit, emo implicit motives can, uh, how they're related to mental health, in particular, We'll talk about what excellent mental health consists of, one definition at least. Then we'll talk about the childhood origin of, of problematic implicit motives. And last but not least, uh, the transformation of implicit motives with reconsolidation of emotional memory. So it's a lot to cover, but I'm going to speed it up by not getting into empirical support to a great degree. Okay, so what is emotion? Um, <clears throat> Here's, here's my concept of it, and I share it with a number of other people. Uh, emotion consists of automatic assessments and adaptive responses to important recurring situations. Um, the function of emotion, arguably, is to enhance adaptation to the environment by learning from experience and interaction with it. 
And we think that the ability to have emotions, including emotional experiences, uh, originated in mammals and not before in, in phylogenesis. Um, so automatic assessments are part of it. What do we mean by that? There's an automatic, unconscious assessment of whether needs, goals, and values are being met in interaction with the environment. And that assessment, which is made all the time uh, on a continuous basis, then leads to the triggering of emotional responses. And these emotional responses involve, it's an automatic assessment followed by an automatic resetting in multiple systems. So um, there's a resetting of physiology. For example, your heart rate may increase. Uh, a change in behavioral tendencies, approach or avoidance, for example, it will influence your cognitive processes. So if there's a threatening stimulus, <clears throat> you become more alert, more sensitive to relevant cues. And then, then there's an additional feeling component, um, such as feeling afraid. And I'll argue that that's a common, com feeling is a common component of emotion, but isn't absolutely necessary. And all this together enables higher organisms to adapt to changing circumstances. <clears throat> so an important aspect of this model is um, that we have something that I'm calling implicit emotion. And that, in a nutshell, is physiology and behavior without the feeling component. So implicit aspects of emotion include automatic motor expressions of emotion, including visceromotor, that is um, autonomic and neuroendocrine changes in the body that support somatomotor responses, skeletal motor responses that, lead, that are, uh, consist of things like facial expressions, gestures, action tendencies, and procedures. So we have uh, peripheral physiology and behavior, and there are sensory consequences. So the concept of unconscious emotion, I think, um, certainly got a foothold in the empirical psychological literature in 2004. It's a paper by Winkleman and Berridge. <clears throat> um, so they, they used this kind of experimental data to support the concept. They showed people pictures of facial affect implicitly so that the um, faces such as a happy face or an angry face was shown very, very quickly, 16 milliseconds in duration, followed by a neutral face for several hundred milliseconds. So that's backward masking. People didn't actually see the emotional face, but it did affect their behavior, specifically including how much of a novel drink the person consumed. They drank more when, with the positive emotion face. Um, they drank less with the angry face. And significantly, it did not influence self-reports of emotion. So this is where we're getting into kind of motiv motivated behavior, right? And um, another aspect of implicit emotion is emotional procedures or the doing of emotion. Uh, Rule-based schemas or scripts for how to do things like express love, handle anger, get attention, joke around, obtain love and reassurance. And this actually was first introduced by the psychoanalyst Robert Kleiman in 1993. You know, kids don't learn how to do these things by reading a book or going to a lecture or attending class. But they live with their families and they see how they're treated, they copy what they observe. So, um, Together with my uh, very talented younger colleague, Ryan Smith, we published this review paper on unconscious emotion in 2016, um, really arguing for the existence of what some people might consider an oxymoron, right? Um, and that some people think that if you don't have emotional experience, it's not emotion, and that's a debatable point. However, um, I would point out that other leading emotion theorists are really making a similar kind of distinction. So Tony Damasio talks about 
emotion and there's those basic uh, biological responses. And there's a separate neuroanatomy for conscious feeling of specific emotion. Joe Ledoux similarly talks about defense responses versus fear experiences. And Lisa Feldman Barrett uh, talks about core affect versus constructed emotional experiences. It's her view that core affect consists of basic uh, fundamental affective valence, you know, positive or negative, associated with action tendencies of approach or avoidance, but specific emotions are constructed and they're conceptual. And um, in this book published a year or two ago, she really lays out the evidence that specific neural circuits for different specific emotions um, really are not supported by the empirical literature. We may hear from Mark Soames that there's an alternative perspective, okay, but this is a debate going on in the field right now. But, um, you know, her view, and it's consistent with what I'm presenting, is that uh, in order to have specific differentiated emotions, you have to have specific concepts that are facilitated by language, okay? As I said, you know, I'm, I'm a clinical psychiatrist, I'm a psychotherapist, and one of the things we do whenever we see someone is we ask, how are you feeling? And put your feelings into words. And why do we do that? And I think that this slide helps to explain that. Uh, and it also helps to explain what might be considered the implicit to explicit transition. So um, you come in with a, a felt um, bodily, bodily felt experience, uh, which uh, Les Greenberg uh, refers to as the live story. Les, Les Greenberg, by the way, um, <clears throat> is the founder and creator of a modality called emotion-focused psychotherapy, and he's written 20 books on the topic. And it's a modality that I like very much because it's grounded in uh, empirical emotion science. So you have bodily felt experience, it's the live story, it's what you experience, and then you have the told story. You put it into words and explain what it is that you're feeling, and that really corresponds to creating a, a mental representation of the experience, a conceptual mental representation that then interacts with the felt experience. This is you know, a two-way street. It's bidirectional. So when you put it into words, it, it affects how you feel. It shifts what you feel. And that becomes the substrate for further elaboration and further description and mental representation. So uh, Les Greenberg calls this a dialectical cycle of meaning construction, going from explaining to experiencing, round and round, lived story, told story, back and forth, which interesting, interestingly he refers to as the dialectical construction of the self. So we're talking a lot about the self, and it's his view that emotion is the core of the self. And the more you know about your emotions, the more differentiated they are, the better elaborated the sense of self is. Okay, so to summarize how I would relate this to implicit motives, implicit motives are instantiated in implicit emotions. Situations are construed in ways that lead to motivated responses. They're automatically elicited and goal-directed. They have behavioral and physiological components, and they're often expressed without reflective awareness. Uh, implicit motives become consciously accessible by reflecting upon the situation and the bodily felt sensations that have been generated to conceptualize and construct the emotion. Emotions tell a person what he or she needs in a situation, which then guides conscious decision-making and behavior. So for example, if you feel sad, it may indicate that you're alone and you need contact with other people, uh, so therefore you might reach out to them as a result of recognizing that you feel sad. Or if you feel angry, it's because well, you're being mistreated and you want the mistreatment to stop. So therefore, you're going to take action. If you're not aware of how you're feeling, you're less likely to take that kind of action. And very importantly, people vary in their ability to know what they're feeling. And 
you know, I can't emphasize that enough um, because people do just vary a great deal and we see that all the time. And that was the basis for uh, my developing the levels of emotional awareness framework to try to understand how it is that people differ so much in their awareness of their own feelings. So, uh, my first paper on this was published, hard to believe, over 30 years ago in 1987 uh, in the American Journal of Psychiatry. And it really reflected an integration of the work of these two smokers, Jean Piaget and Sigmund Freud. Uh, I got a smile, that's good. Usually it's, I would get a laugh. <laughs> uh, so Jean Piaget, obviously the father of the field of cognitive development, Sigmund Freud, creator of psychoanalysis. Um, but the concept of emotional awareness is also relevant to more contemporary figures, such as the Dalai Lama, the spiritual head of, the, of Buddhist religion, and Paul Ekman, who you know, is, is one of the foundational uh, emotion researchers who first started doing you know, well-validated empirical work on emotion involving facial expression maybe 50 years ago, 60 years ago. And the title of the book is Emotional Awareness. Uh, Overcoming coming the Obstacles to Psychological Balance and Compassion. So what we proposed back in 1987 was a cognitive developmental model. And at the time, it, it was a radical thing to say that the ability to be aware of one's own emotions is a cognitive skill like any other. This ability develops over time. And similar to Piaget's stages of cognitive development, developmental transformations occur in the capacity to be aware of one's own feelings. And I should say that um, Piaget talked about stages of cognitive development and we talk about levels because emotion is changing all the time, but we're talking about the structural characteristics of emotion um, and emotional experience. So according to Piaget, Cognition becomes more differentiated and integrated with development. And we say that the, the higher the level of emotional awareness, the greater the differentiation, integration, and desomatization of emotional experience and expression. So by desomatization, what I mean is that emotion starts off in the body. It's what I referred to as implicit emotion. And then as it evolves into specific differentiated feelings, the somatic component is still there, but it becomes more attenuated and more differentiated. Uh, these are the five levels of emotional awareness, and I've hi highlighted the first two in yellow, uh, both in the text as well as um, in this uh, schematic nested hierarchy. Uh, because the levels are hierarchically related. And the idea is as you go up each level, it modulates the level came before. So Piaget talked about uh, sensory motor cognition as stage one, and we've differentiated that into two levels. Level one is bodily sensation, uh, and level two is action tendencies, visceromotor, and somatomotor. So if you ask someone how they feel, and they say, I feel sick, I feel tired, I feel dizzy, that's level one. Level two, I'd feel like punching the wall, or something uh, just grossly valenced, but not specific for emotion, like I'd feel good or bad, which is something we hear all the time. Good or bad is less differentiated than specific emotion terms at level three. I can feel happy, sad, angry, afraid. Level three, it's unequivocally emotion. And at level four, we have blends of experience, multidimensional experience, feeling happy and sad at the same time. So uh, when my daughter graduated from high school, I felt happy and sad at the same time. Uh, now, 14 years later, She's finished medical school, she's finished her pediatric training, and she's moving back to Tucson, and I'm just delighted. That's just level three, okay. All right, 
Level five, multidimensional experience of self and other. The ability to appreciate complexity in yourself and another person at the same time, which um, often happens uh, in the case of accurate empathy, right? Particularly in a psychotherapeutic context. Okay, so um, <clears throat> what we're really getting at is that, well, let me just say first, I'm sorry, that this is open to a, both a state and a trait interpretation. So when we give our levels of emotional awareness scale and people describe how self and other would feel in 20 different situations, we're really going after the trait level on average, what, what level is a person functioning at. But it also applies to different states. So um, states fluctuate. And in, in cases of high arousal, you'll likely go down to a lower level, it's less differentiated. Um, so, I like to show this slide to convey the concept of the extent of a person's emotion repertoire, okay? How many crayons are in their pack, right? If you, if you have a limited size pack of eight different emotions, 16, 24, uh, 64. Um, I would bring this up in relation to the psychoanalytic concept of uh, drive and defense, that uh, the classic model is that um, you interpret the defense and when you overcome the defense, the emotion comes out. And indeed, that you know, is often the case. The question though is, uh, you know, what's the extent and complexity of the person's repertoire to work with, right? So this is where uh, kind of the issue of deficits comes in uh, while also considering the issue of conflicts. All right. So the basic idea is, is that the more extensive your emotion repertoire, the better able you'll be to know how you're feeling, how other people are feeling. You'll be better able to problem solve and things should in general go better. And we do have some evidence to support that. Um, here, I want to show you uh, this list of um, what um, Jonathan Shedler calls a kind of definition of mental health. Um, and the reason I'm showing this to you is that as I, you know, when I go through the characteristics, um, you know, it really does describe somebody who's very psychologically healthy and working well with their own emotions. And one question for the group is, is this a, a definition of flourishing? So let me go through some of these. Um, kind of small print here. <laughs> okay. Is able to use his or her talents, abilities, and energies effectively and productively. Enjoys challenges, takes pleasure in accomplishing things is capable of sustaining a meaningful love relationship characterized by genuine intimacy and caring, finds meaning and belonging and contributing to a larger community like an organization, church, or neighborhood, is able to find meaning and fulfillment in guiding, mentoring, and nurturing others, uh, is empathic, is sensitive and responsive to other people's needs and feelings, is able to assert him or herself effectively and appropriately when necessary, appreciates and responds to humor, is capable of <clears throat> hearing information that's emotionally threatening, uh, that challenges cher cherished beliefs, perceptions, and self-perceptions, and can use and benefit from such feedback, appears to have come to terms with painful experiences from the past, has found meaning in and grown from such experiences, then, is articulate, can express self well in words, uh, has an active and satisfying sex life, appears comfortable and at ease in social situations, generally finds contentment and happiness in life's activities, uh, tends to express affect appropriate in quality and intensity to the situation at hand. I'd say you definitely need high levels of emotional awareness for that has the capacity to recognize alternative viewpoints, even in matters that stir up strong feelings, has moral and ethical standards, strives to live up to them, 
uh, is creative, able to use, uh, able to see things or approach problems in novel ways, tends to be conscientious and responsible, tends to be energetic and outgoing, is psychologically insightful, able to understand self and others in subtle and sophisticated ways, is able to find meaning and satisfaction in the pursuit of long-term goals and ambitions, and is able to form close and lasting friendships characterized by mutual support and sharing of experiences. How come we're not all like that? Uh, uh, what gets in the way of excellent mental health? So just broadly speaking, um, I think it has to do with our inherent dual nature as individuals and social creatures, which inevitably leads to conflicts. We have the biological imperative of the species in that individuals need to survive in order to procreate uh, as social beings. So we're inherently, we have an inherent dual nature as individuals and social creatures. Uh, that involves competition and cooperation. It's hard to succeed without both. Um, but conflict between these agendas is inevitable and universal. Resolution of those conflicts requires growth and development to expand the emotion repertoire and improve behavioral flexibility. Uh, and I am a fan of Blatt's theory of personal, personality development involving two major goals. One as an individual striving for self-definition and self-actualization, and as a social, social person, relatedness and attachment and intimacy. And he lays this out in this important book, Polarities of Experience. And we can think of this, we've talked about differentiation and integration with regard to emotion as the core of the self. And I think we can think about um, self-definition and relatedness as differentiation and integration at the person level. Um, these, these two trends are not isolated, but interactive. So we have relatedness here. We have milestones of trust, cooperation, and intimacy. And here, with regard to self-definition, autonomy, initiative, industry, generativity, they're interactive through development, ultimately ending up, ideally, with integrity. Now, of course, not everyone gets there um, to achieve those goals. And he says, no, seriously, his final words actually were, if only I had spent more time in the office. Okay. Um, this was the first joke slide of the conference. <laughs> One more. Um, I think what, what interferes with you know, development is not just having the conflict, but having trouble processing the emotions that go along with the conflict. And so here he says, look, call it denial if you like, but I think what goes on in my personal life is none of my own damn business. Okay, uproarious laughter, I see. <laughs> All right, so um, we have maladaptive emotional avoidance. I'm thankful to my colleague, Mark Lumley, who, um, who I borrowed this slide from. Um, there are many different varieties of emotional avoidance. Um, we have alexithymia and affective agnosia, which is uh, something that I've written about in terms of a, a trait deficit in your level of emotional awareness. But there are a variety of other concepts in the psychological literature, experiential avoidance, emotional suppression, thought suppression, uh, self-concealment, trauma non-disclosure, I'm sorry, um, and low emotional intelligence, um, probably um, certain uh, unconscious defenses would also fit in here as well. So why do people uh, avoid emotional distress? Well, it really has to do with uh, being a human being, uh, having social relationships and complicated work situations, and oftentimes this conflict between what you need as an individual and what you need you know, to maintain your relationships 
with other people. Sibling rivalries, conflicts over autonomy or dependency, shame over desires, religious and sexual struggles. These are the kinds of things that in research we find people have difficulty um, talking about with regard to their emotions. Guilt over transgressions, fear of rejection if not doing for others, fears of intimacy. Uh, harassment at work, problems with spouse and kids. So, uh, avoided emotions uh, may compromise mental health. Uh, implicit motives arise in conflict situations that trigger emotions that are difficult to process. Avoided emotions often involve unmet needs, uh, both in the present and the past. If the needs were unmet earlier in life, and then you have a similar situation later in life, it's particularly hard to deal with. Conflicts tend to persist because avoided emotions motivate behavior that keep the emotions hidden. Okay. So, um, for example, fear of rejection if not doing for others. By continually doing for others and neglecting your own needs and wants, you're uh, avoiding dealing with that fear and avoid, avoiding dealing with your own needs and wants. Becoming aware of those emotions enables unmet needs to become known and addressed. Okay, so um, a very common context, but by no means the only context, where these kinds of difficulties in processing your emotions comes up and having unmet needs is in the case of trauma or early adversity in childhood. Uh, trauma, by definition, is overwhelming and exceeds the child's coping capacity. Experiences are often not shared with others. Uh, it would, it's a double whammy if the parent is the perpetrator, because if a child is somehow abused outside the home, they might be able to come home and get the support and nurturance uh, from their parents. But if it's happening inside the home, um, they have both the abuse and the lack of support, and they're, they're on their own, and they have to adapt somehow. So adjustments are made to minimize emotional distress. So that involves directing attention away from emotional distress and developing habits like being withdrawn from others or becoming pessimistic. If you're pessimistic and you're not expecting good things to happen, you'll be less disappointed when good things don't happen. Uh, but the problem is uh, that these adjustments were adaptive in the original context but are maladaptive later in life. So, um, what we find clinically is that people have repetitive patterns, which we think is an expression of implicit emotional memories. Clients often come to psychotherapy because they're unhappy with aspects of their social or occupational lives. They're typically unaware that this is part of a behavioral pattern triggered by interpersonal situations that are reminders of problematic situations from the past. Uh, the problematic response to these situations consists of behavioral patterns that aim to assure avoidance of the experience of dreaded and unwanted affect. So, um, that's the story on implicit motives and where they come from and how you might you know, come to recognize what they are, but how do you change them? So in, in 2015, uh, my colleagues and I, uh, two from the University of Arizona, Lee Ryan and Lynn Nadell and Les Greenberg from Toronto, wrote this paper in a leading neuroscience journal that basically was arguing for a common mechanism for how change occurs in all major psychotherapy modalities that bring about change. And, um, you know, this, the idea is that it's reconsolidation of emotional memories. And this draws on work, particularly in the past 20 years, where we've discovered that, you know, memories are not stable and fixed but are malleable under certain conditions. And so really the question is, how can you take advantage of that therapeutically to help people? 
Um, so this paper was published in uh, Behavioral and Brain Sciences. The format is that there's a target article and then there are commentaries. I think there are 24 commentaries, one of which was written by Mark Solms. And it was a very helpful commentary and I'm going to refer to what you said here. Uh, you pointed out that memory is not just for recalling the past, uh, but it's a guide to the future. Memory is adaptive because it keeps a record of what did and didn't work in the past. The key benefit is that it serves as a guide to similar situations in the future. Having memories that do not change would limit the ability to adapt to a changing future. Having some capacity to update memories in light of changing circumstances can optimize adaptive flexibility, but changes need to be made prudently. So, one of the novel things that we put forward um, uh, in this paper was what we're calling the integrated memory model. And we talk about episodic memories, which are um, personal experiences or autobiographical memory, semantic structures, uh, such as generalized knowledge, and uh, emotional responses, arousal, action, and feeling. And we made the argument that it's impossible to activate one without the others. So, uh, so for example, giving this talk, um, I have background knowledge about what it's like to give a talk and what you expect to happen. And uh, now I'm encoding specifically this group and uh, then I'm also having emotional responses in the moment. It's all kind of interacting, right? So, um, we wrote this paper in 2015. Uh, we decided to expand on this and um, had a conference in 2017 in Tucson. And it was the uh, first time when the four authors were all in the same room two years after the paper was published. Um, and that's turned into a book that's going to be published later this year by Oxford University Press. So at this conference, um, one of the presenters, uh, a very clever neuroscientist named Ajay Saput, noticed that, um, that the, our last names made an acronym, uh, which he says, you know, so Lane, Ryan, Nadell, Greenberg, that our, our model of change was the learning model. Uh, and the learning model is as follows. We said that there are three essential ingredients for change in psychotherapy. Uh, first is you have to activate old memories and old feelings with or without their connection to the past. Okay, so here's where emotional awareness is playing a role. Uh, secondly, you have to concurrently engage new emotional experiences that will change the old memories through reconsolidation. And then you, the third step is to reinforce the strength of these new memories and their semantic structures by practicing new ways of behaving and experiencing the world in a variety of contexts. And so that third step uh, is often referred to as working through and translating that into memory terms, we talk about making the transition from episodic memories to semantic structures. So just to illustrate what I mean by that, imagine a little child uh, out in the park. It observes a creature that is medium-sized, red, has wings, feathers, beak, can fly, it's called a robin. Uh, then, a little bit later, sees another creature, yellow, small, it has these same features of wings, feather, beak, and can fly. Over time, the, the common features precipitate out with the concept of bird, right? So this is an abstracted kind of generalization uh, or abstract concept, which is a semantic structure. So we think the same thing happens in development, right? So that uh, in emotional development, relevant features of recurring situations are, restract, are extracted including who's involved, what transpires, how it feels, how you should respond, how other people respond to you. These memories are the elements of the internal working model of how the, the social world operates, right? 
So we think it's that internal working model that we're trying to modify in psychotherapy and that we're updating uh, with reconsolidation by virtue of new emotional input such that the, when you're in a familiar situation, you'll construe it differently and you'll have different emotional responses and we might say you've transformed your implicit motives. Um, your research shows that different kinds of memory are more or less easy to update. It's, easier to, it's easiest to update a specific episodic or autobiographical memory. It's harder to update a semantic memory because that's maybe because it's a distillation of multiple experiences and hardest to uh, update are procedures or habits. So people can make a lot of progress by uh, having corrective experiences and learning about what kinds of situations they're prone to having difficulty in and they may have new ways of dealing with the situation. But it takes a while for these new ways of construing and responding to become more automatic. Okay, so here are a set of conclusions. Uh, flourishing is an emotional and behavioral state that is prevented or diminished by unacknowledged or unprocessed emotional distress. Unacknowledged distress influences behavior uh, and thus qualifies as an implicit motive. Implicit motives can become known by transforming implicit motives emotions into explicit feelings and determining what one needs. This in turn can influence decision making and behavior. Implicit motives elicited in specific situations are transformed when the construal mechanisms that generated them are altered. Altering them requires reactivation of the memories relevant to the situation and experiencing the painful emotions that had been avoided as Les Greenberg would say, you, ha you must arrive before you can leave. New emotional experiences, often of a corrective nature and often involving another person, enable the old problematic memory to be updated and transformed, uh, permitting more flexible construals in future situations. Uh, emotional distress is less likely to be generated uh, and more positive emotions can come to the fore with practice, the ability to thrive can become more automatic. So, um, let's see. So I want to acknowledge these major collaborators in these two areas of levels of emotional awareness and memory reconsolidation. I want to thank you for the invitation to participate and thank you for your attention. <laughs>